So, um, missing Kaylee and Gracie Poo. Good morning, everybody. Okay, Redfern. Back to Redfern. Yep. Before, before we get going on chapter four, Jason, put that away, please. Um, I need to talk quickly about scene changes. What on earth am I talking about when I say scene changes? What do you think that means, Parker? It says like flowers and grass, and then it says what? Yeah, like okay, then you go up to the mountains. Okay, so the scenery is changing. Um. Sean, what else? You're in one place, then you're somewhere else. Let me go to a virtual friend, Zekel. Kind of what Sean said, like, um, when, like, the scene changes. Like, if, like, you're in a scene where you're, like, arguing, and then, like, you go to a scene where you're walking outside... Then the scene changes into a different setting and topic. Yeah, so, and a lot of times when this happens, it's not like, okay, Miss Bab is standing in front of the class and now Miss Bab is leaving the class. I came back to the class, don't worry. Um, that in that particular instance like the story is telling as i'm changing the scenes but sometimes a scene change happens kind of abruptly meaning it just the end of one chapter happens and when the next chapter happens your character is somewhere completely different and in that case usually not only has the scenery jump a little bit but there's been a jump in time a little bit too fiona you still have your hand raised I'm trying to already figure mine out because it's like I know that like originally I um, when the book originally started in chapter one, um he was at his house in the city and when he found a red bum in his house. Um and he was in the city and he said this is no place for a dog, this you need to go back to the country. And then the next chapter in chapter two, he comes with a kid and he wants two red bones in his house and he's working for him and um, out the country. Okay, so Fiona already noticed a big scene change and jump when the flashback happened at the beginning. He was an older man in the city in his house, and he found a red bone coon hound, which made him flash back to when he was a little boy out in the country and was saving his money to get the hounds. I've already told you once to put this away. That didn't mean put it in your lap where you thought I couldn't see it. Okay? Get your up. Get out your red fern book. Please. Just follow directions today. Or I'm going to send you to the office and you can do it all by yourself again. Okay. Um, so sometimes though, we're gonna stay in the time frame of him being a little boy today, but our scene is going to jump a little bit. And when it jumps, some time is going to have passed. We don't necessarily know what happened during that time, but we can assume that it probably wasn't important to the story if the author left, didn't put it in there. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at what how the scene is going to change today. And we're going to chapter oh. four. Okay. Oh, I wanted to ask, does everybody, it looked like a couple of books got switched out last night. I, um, does everybody have their copy of Red Fern now? Kaylee, Lucas, you guys got your Red Ferns now? There's 
Hello. Lucas, you got your right in front copy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, here we go. Chapter four. Day after day, I flew to the store. Grandpa would shake his head. Then on a Monday, as I entered the store, I sensed a change in him. He was in high spirits, talking and laughing with a half a dozen farmers. Every time I caught his eye, he would smile and wink at me. I thought the farmers would never leave, but finally the store was empty. Grandpa told me the letter had come. The kennels were still there, and they still had dogs for sale. He said he had made the mail buggy wait while he made out the order. And another thing, the dog market had gone downhill. The price of dogs had dropped $5, so he handed me back a $10 bill. Now, there's still one stump in the way, he said. The mail buggy can't carry things like dogs. So they'll come as far as the depot in Taliqua, but you'll get the notice here because I ordered them in your name. I thanked my grandfather with all my heart and asked him how long I'd have to wait for the notice. He said, I don't know, but it shouldn't take more than a couple of weeks. I asked how I was going to get my dogs out from Taliqua. Well, there's always someone going in, he said, and you could ride in with them. That evening, the silence of our supper was interrupted when I asked my father this question. Papa, how far is it to Kentucky? I may as well have exploded a bomb. For an instant, there was complete silence, and then my older sister giggled. The two little ones just stared at me. With a half-hearted laugh, my father said, well, now I don't know, but it's a pretty good ways. What do you want to know for? Thinking of taking a trip to Kentucky, are you? No, I said. Just wondered. My youngest sister giggled and asked, can I go with you? I just glared at her. Mama broke into the conversation. I declare, what kind of question is that? How far is it to Kentucky? I don't know what's gotten into that mind of yours lately. You go around like you were lost. You're losing weight. You're skinny as a rail. And look at that hair. Just last Sunday, they had a haircut over at Tom Rowland's place, but you couldn't go. You had to go prowling around the river in the woods. I told Mama that I'd get a haircut next time they had a cutting. And I just heard some fellas talking about Kentucky up at the store and wondered how far away it was. Much to my relief, the conversation ended. The days dragged by. A week passed and still no word about my dogs. Terrible thoughts ran through my mind. Maybe my dogs were lost. The train had a wreck. Someone stole my money. Or perhaps the mailman lost my order. Then, at the end of the second week, the notice came. My grandfather told me that he'd talk to Jim Hodges that day. He was going into town in about a week, and I could ride in with him to pick up my dogs. Again, I thanked my grandfather. I started for home. Walking along in deep thought, I decided it was time to tell my father the whole story. I fully intended to tell him that evening. I tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. I wasn't scared of him, for he never whipped me. He was always kind and gentle, but for some reason, I don't know why, I just couldn't tell him. That night, snuggled deep in the soft folds of the feather bed, I lay thinking. I had waited so long for my dogs, and I so desperately wanted to see them and hold them. I didn't want to wait a whole week. In a flash, I made up my mind. Very quietly, I got up and put on my clothes. I sneaked into the kitchen and got one of Mama's precious flour sacks. In it, I put six eggs, some leftover cornbread, a little salt, and a few matches. Next, I went to the smokehouse and cut off a piece of salt pork. I stopped at the barn and picked up a gunny sack. I put the flour sack inside the gunny sack. This I rolled up and crammed lengthwise in the bib of my overalls. I was on my way. I was going after my dogs. Taliqua was a small country town with a population of about 800. By the road, it was 32 miles away. But as the crow flies, it was only 20 miles. What does that mean, as the crow flies? I guess. Uh, Fiona, what do you think? I saw your hand first. I think it says flies in it, so maybe like by the flies, they go maybe faster than like a wagon would. Okay, they can move faster than, well, I don't know if a crow flies faster than a wagon being pulled by a horse that's running. But what that, that means is what, Zico? So, um, I have an example too, but it means like the direct line, like, the road doesn't go like straight through the woods to exactly where it is but like the direct line like from our house like smitty's sporting goods is only like 15 miles away but by road it's like 30 so 
Yeah, I've got an example for you. Here we go. For me? <laughs> As the crow flies, like Zeke said, it means it's a direct path. Because does a crow, if a crow is flying somewhere, does it have to stay on a road? Does it have to fly over a road? No. So, like, here's my house. Yay, that's my happy little house. Um, and can you guys all see it? Can you pin yourself? Um, okay, here's my house. And here's the road in front of my house. Now, back behind my house, there is a pharmacy. So I'm going to put RX for pharmacy. Um, but the road goes all the way down here and then this way and then this way and then this way. So if I stayed on the road, it would actually be about a mile or two for me to get to the pharmacy. But I could just walk through my backyard in an empty field and then I'd be right there. So this is as the road, but this would be as the crow flies, because a crow could go from my roof to their roof, and it would get there, as you like can see, seconds. like way quicker. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And that really is true. There's a pharmacy like right behind my house. What pharmacy? Hillsboro Health Mart. So if you guys want to go to Hillsboro Health Mart, and then you just start walking, you'll end up in my backyard. That's just kind of all right, it's a little creepy. Don't do that. You might scare me if I look in my backyard and see kids wandering out of the woods. Um, all right. Um, okay. I now I've totally lost our Okay. As the crow flies straight through the hills. So he doesn't have to, if he's walking, does he have to stay on the roads? He can go straight through the hills so he can get there a little bit quicker. Okay. Although I had never been to town in my life, I knew what direction to take. Taliqua and the railroad lay on the other side of the river from our place. I had the Frisco Railroad on my right and the Illinois River on my left. Not far from where the railroad crossed the river lay the town of Taliqua. I knew if I bore to the right, I would find the railroad. And if I bore to the left, I had the river to guide me. Sometime that night, I crossed the river on a riffle somewhere in the Dripping Springs County country. Coming out of the river bottoms, I scatted up a long hogback ridge and broke out on top of the flats. In a mile-eaten trot, I moved along. I had the wind of a deer, the muscles of a country boy, a heart full of dog love, and a strong determination. I wasn't scared of the darkness or the mountains, for I was raised in those mountains. On and on, mile after mile, I moved along. I saw faint, faint gray streaks appear in the east. I knew daylight was close. My bare feet were getting sore from the front flint rocks and saw briars. Ouch. I stopped beside a mountain stream, soaked my feet in the cool water, rested for a spell, and then started on. After leaving the mountain stream, my pace was much slower. The muscles of my legs were getting stiff. Feeling the pangs of hunger gnawing at my stomach, I decided I would stop and eat at the next stream I found. Then I remembered I'd forgotten in to include a can in which to boil my eggs. I stopped and built a small fire. Cutting off a nice thick slab of salt pork, I roasted it, and with a piece of cold, cold cornbread, made a sandwich. Putting out my fire, I was on my way again. I ate as I trotted along, and I felt much better. I came into Taliqua from the northeast. At the outskirts of town, I hid my flour sack and provisions, keeping the gunny sack. I walked into town. I was scared of Taliqua and the people. I had never seen such a big town and so many people. There were store after store, some of them two stories high. The wagon yard had wagons on top of wagons, teams, buggies, and horses. Two young ladies about my age stopped, stared at me, and then giggled. My blood boiled, but I couldn't under but I could understand. After all, I had three sisters. They couldn't help it because they were women folks. I went on. Why do you think the girl stopped, stared, and giggled? Because he's DJ. Because he's He's like, he's all muddy, he has like no shoes, and they're just sitting there like, come on, he's all dirty, he's got shoes, like. Right, he's all dirty, doesn't have shoes on his feet, his feet are probably all tore up because he's been literally he's walking even, for 20 miles now with no shoes on his feet. Um, Sophie said his hair's all, we know his hair's all scraggly because I mentioned several times now the kid needs a haircut bad. Um, so yeah, he definitely probably looks kind of 
homeless, honestly, um, and compared to people that live in the city. Um, it is, yeah, Lils, thank you. Um, okay. So he's not used to being in the city, but he knew that they were kind of making fun of him. So could have had a crush on him. Could be, but I'm going to go with he looks crazy because he looks homeless compared to the people in the city. Um, I saw a big man coming up the street. The bright, shiny star on his vest looked as big as a bucket. I saw the long black gun at his side, and I froze in my tracks. I'd heard of sheriffs and marshals, but I'd never seen one. Stories repeated about them in the mountains told how fast they were with a gun and how many men they had killed. Killed? Yeah. I guess. The closer he came, the more frightened I got. I knew it was the end for me. I could just see him aiming his big black gun and shoot me between the eyes. It seemed like a miracle that he passed by hardly glancing at me. Breathing a sigh, I walked on, seeing the wonders of the world. Why do you think he was so scared of a sheriff? Okay. Okay, Josie, what do you think? It said that he hasn't, like, he heard about them, but didn't see them ever before and like heard stories about them and obviously some stories what it explains right yeah it said the stories he heard said they're just randomly shooting people and killing them we know that's not how sheriffs actually do the job um they don't just walk around killing muddy children <laughs> um but uh but to him he knows he's clearly different than the people in the town and that he probably stands out a little bit. The girls already laughed at him, so he knows that he's not like the others around there. And so I guess he was probably just worried that the sheriff was going to realize he was different and say, you don't belong here. Blow him away. Um, wow. All right. Passing a large store window, I stopped and stared. There in the window was the most wonderful sight I had ever seen. Everything under the sun. Overalls, jackets, bolts of beautiful cloth. New harnesses, collars, bridles, and then my eyes did pop open. There were several guns, and one of them had two barrels. I couldn't believe it. Two barrels? I had seen several guns, but never one with two barrels. Then I saw something else. The sun was just right, and the plate glass was a perfect mirror. I saw the full reflection of myself for the first time in my life. Wait, but he's never in that mirror? They didn't even have a mirror. I do not live. So they didn't have a mirror at his house, so he didn't actually even know what he. Can you imagine being? He's older than you guys now, because when the story started, he was ten, but then two years passed, so he's twelve now, and he's never seen himself what he looked like. All right. So I could see that I did look a little odd. My straw-colored hair was long and shaggy and was bushed out like a corn tassel that had been hit by a wind. I tried to smooth it down with my hands. This helped some, but not much. What it needed was a good combing, and I had no comb. My overalls were patched and faded, but they were clean. My shirt had pulled out. I tucked it back in. I took one look at my bare feet and winced. They were as brown as dead sycamore leaves. The spiderweb pattern of raw red scratches looked odd in the saddle brown skin. I thought, well, I won't have to pick any more blackberries and the scratches will soon go away. I pumped up one of my arms and thought, surely the muscle was going to pop right through my thin blue shirt. I stuck out my tongue. It was as red as pokeberry juice and anything that color was supposed to be healthy. After making a few faces at myself, I put my thumbs in my ears and was making mule ears when two old women came by. They stopped and stared at me. I stared back. Mm -hmm. As they turned to go on their way, I heard one of them say something to the other. The words were hard to catch, but I did hear one word, wild. As I said before, they couldn't help it. They was women folks. Women folks. Women folks. Just women folks running their mouths, laughing at kids, calling them wild. That's women folks. Me. That just be embarrassing. That's how <laughs> This is way back then. Now, listen, remember yesterday we talked about, let's, let's flip over to social studies real quick when you're talking about the times. And back then, women cooked, cleaned, raised the kids. The end.
Um, did they? They didn't even really go to like some of them didn't even go to school. That's didn't read. So it was just about this time, around the time of World War One, when women had to step up and do more things, and they started doing more. Before then, the men thought that they were better, thought that they were superior, and so they did. They talked about women like that. They were like, ah, they're just women. They're just them women folk. How dare they? <laughs> um, anyway, you call us them women folks now, you might get. I don't know. Um, anyway, all right. Not by me. I'm not popping nobody. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Hang on. Did I turn the page? Wow. Okay. All right. As I turned to leave, my eyes again fell on the overalls and the bolts of cloth. I thought of my mother, father, and sister. Uh, Miss Beth. Sir? Yeah. Uh, um, I'm. Um, did, did, hold on. Okay, never mind. Okay, never mind. It you just skipped two sentences. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. All right. I thought of my mother, father, and sisters. Here was an opportunity to make amends for leaving home without telling anyone. I entered the store. I bought a pair of overalls for Papa. After telling the storekeeper how big my mother and sisters were, I bought several yards of cloth. I also bought a large sack of candy. Glancing down at my bare feet, the storekeeper said, I have some good shoes. I told him I didn't need any shoes. He asked if that would be all. I nodded. He added up the bill. I handed him my $10, and he gave me my change. I think you could buy a pair of overalls, a sack of candy, and a couple things of cloth for less than $10. But again, remember, this was way back in the day. Ten dollars was like having a couple hundred dollars. So, yeah. Okay. After wrapping up the bundles, he helped me put them in my sack. Lifting it to my shoulder, I turned and left the store. Out on the street, I picked out a friendly-looking old man and asked him where the depot was. He told me to go down to the last street and turn right. Go as far as I could, and I couldn't miss it. I thanked him and started on my way. Leaving the main part of town, I started up a long street through the residential section. I had never seen so many beautiful houses, and they were all different colors. The lawns were neat and clean and looked like green carpet. I saw a man pushing some kind of a mowing machine. I stopped to watch the whirling blades. He gawked at me, and I hurried on. I heard a lot of shouting and laughing ahead of me. Not wanting to miss anything, I walked a little faster. I saw what was making the noise. More kids than I had ever seen were playing around a big red brick building. It's cool. I thought some rich man lived there and was giving a party for his children. Walking up to the edge of the playground, I stopped to watch. The boys and girls were about my age and were as thick as flies around a sorghum mill. They were milling, running, and jumping. Peter totters and swings were loaded down with them. Everyone was laughing and having a big time. Over against the building, a large blue pipe ran up on an angle from the ground. A few feet from the top, there was a bend in it. The pipe seemed to go into the building. Boys were crawling into its dark mouth. I counted nine of them. One boy stood about six feet from the opening with a stick in his hand. Staring goo-eyed, trying to figure out what they were doing, I got a surprise. Out of the hollow pipe spurted a boy. He sailed through the air and lit on his feet. The boy with the stick marked the ground where he landed. All nine of them came shooting out, one behind the other. As each boy landed, a new mark was scratched. They ganged around looking at the lines. There was a lot of loud talking, pointing, and arguing. Then all the lines were erased, and a new scorekeeper was picked out. The others crawled back into the pipe. What were they doing? It's a slide, right? Right, he's never seen a slide before. Has he ever been to school? No. It goes into the school. Apparently, it was like hooked to the school, and they were coming out. And as they came out, apparently they got some speed going because they were shooting out of the bottom and then landing, and they were marking where they landed. I'm assuming to see who would go the farthest, right? School was just the Okay, I figured out how the game was played. After climbing to the top of the slide, the boys turned around and sat down. One at a time, they came flying down and out feet first. The one that shot the furthest was clearly the winner. 
I thought how wonderful it would be if I could slide down just one time. One boy spying me standing on the corner came over. Looking me up and down, he asked, do you go to school here? I said, school? He said, sure, school. What'd you think this was? Oh, no, I don't go to school here. Do you go to Jefferson? I do. We do. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I don't go to school here. Oh, wait. No, I don't go there either. Don't you go to school at all? Sure, I go to school. Where? At home. You go to school at home? I nodded. What grade are you in? I said I wasn't in any grade. Puzzled, he said, you go to school at home and you don't know what grade you're in? Who teaches you? My mother. What does she teach you? I said, reading, writing, arithmetic. And I bet I'm just as good at it as you are. He asked, don't you have any shoes? I said, sure, I have shoes. Why aren't you wearing them? I don't wear shoes until it gets cold. He laughed and asked where I live. I said, back in the hills. Oh, you're a hillbilly, he said. Oh, and his name is Billy? Mm -hmm. He ran back to the mob. I saw him pointing at me and talking to several boys. They started my way, young hillbilly, hillbilly. That is mean. Just before they reached me, a bell started ringing. Turning, they ran to the front of the building, lined up in two long lines, and marching like little tin soldiers, disappeared inside the school. The playground was silent, and I was all alone and felt lonely and sad. I heard a noise on my right. I didn't have to turn around to recognize what it was. Someone was using a hoe. I'd know that sound if I heard it on a dark night. It was a little old white-headed woman working in a flower bed. Looking again at the long blue pipe, I thought, there's no one around. Maybe I could have one slide anyway. I eased over and looked up into the dark hollow. It looked scary, but I thought of all the other boys I'd seen crawl into it. I could see oh, the last this, mark on the ground, and I thought, I bet I can beat that. This baby's going to climb. Is this going to chapter? Yeah, pretty close. He's well, going like, to climb into the slide, and it's, he's going to reach the top, and it's going to be like inside the school, and it'll be like, who are you? Mm. Okay. Laying my sack down, I started climbing up. The farther I went, the darker and more scary it got. Just as I reached the top, my feet slipped. Down I sailed. All the way down, I tried to grab onto something, but there was nothing to grab. I'm sure some great champions had slid out of that pipe, and no doubt more than one world record had been broken. But if someone had been there when I came out, I know the record I set would stand today in all its glory. I came out just like I went in, feet first and belly down. My legs were spread out like a bean shooter stop. Arms flail in the air. I zoomed out and up. I seemed to hang suspended in the air at the peak of my climb. I could see the hard-packed ground far below. As I started down, I shut my eyes tight and gritted my teeth. This didn't seem to help. With a splattering sound, I landed. I felt the air whoosh out between my teeth. I tried to scream, but I had no wind left to make a sound. Got the wind knocked out of him. After bouncing a couple of times, I finally settled down to earth. I lay spread eagle for a few seconds and then slowly got to my knees. Hearing loud laughter, I looked around. It was the little old lady with the hoe in her hand. She hollered and asked how I liked it. Without answering, I grabbed up my gunny sack and left. Far up the street, I looked back. The little old lady was sitting down rocking with laughter. I couldn't understand these town people. If they weren't staring at a fella, they were laughing at him. All right. There is chapter four. He completely forgot about the dogs. He has not completely forgotten about the dogs. I can promise you that. Um, all right. So today, on your worksheet today, you've got some questions. Yes, you need to do it. You've got the vocabulary. Yes, you need to do it. And you've got, at the beginning, it actually says changing scenery. And on the back, you've got, it says the city and the country. And you're going to brainstorm and write some words, some adjectives that describe the city and some words that describe the country. Easy enough?
Yeah. Okay. And then there's one more enrichment question at the bottom. And yes, I want you to answer that too. We've got plenty of time today. So yes, I want you to do all of it today. The enrichment question is, Billy thinks he's an outsider in this new place. Why? Okay, so, all right, it's not a right there question that you can look it up in the book. It's something that you have to infer. What do you know about Billy so far? What did we read in the book? Put it all together. Yeah, Josie. So are we, are we day one going to write about where he lives or about, like, um, the town that he's now in? Um, write about the town that he's in right now visiting versus the country that he lives in. What we've heard about it so far. Or, I mean, you could just use general words that you could use to describe the country and the city as well. So like country as in the U.S. or? Country like farmland. Oh, okay. <laughs> like we live in the country part of Festus, not the city part of Festus. Some of you might live in more like city area, but like I live in the city part of Hillsboro. We are right now in the country. Sean, did I miss you? Yeah. All right. So everybody's got their papers now. Zeke, did it share with you like it was supposed to? Yeah, I did. Okay. All right, good. Then you guys should all be set. That's all I got for today. I'm going to hit stop record. Do you guys have any other questions? Or I will let you go. Bye. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. See you in a little bit.